This is one of the last places to be discovered by the white man, to which civilization has come. Every day brings something new. You cannot plan anything for tomorrow. Every day is new. That is why the first missionaries from the very beginning called this the land of the unexpected. There were five uh, Capuchin missionaries that came in 1955 and began the mission. And virtually were among the first outsiders here in Papua New Guinea in uh, the highlands. They didn't know what to expect, but they came with a very uh, adventurous and very generous heart. And before they started putting up structures and buildings and things like that, they spent time living with the people in their villages. Uh, just to get around and move around and establish little uh, trust with the people. It took a little bit of time because uh, even when I go into the deep bush now, there are children who are afraid because, you know, they say, white man, white man, and, and start running away because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something so different and so, you know, fearful, I suppose, to them, you know, so different. When that first contact takes place and a level of trust is established, then uh, things were able to grow from there. When the missionaries began their work here, the nuns came. People did not know how to approach them. Here in the mountains, the men have traditionally taken all the decisions in the village. It was impossible for a woman to stand up and say something or express a view. And I was a little girl and I saw these nuns coming with these big round things and with long clothes and all this. And I was really wondering who they were. Are they, are they men or are they women? Who are they? I was curious to know who they were and I used to go under their legs and look to see who they were, what they were. Are they birds or are they human beings or? One day I asked, I said, excuse me, teacher, who are these people? I said, they are sisters, they are nuns. Okay, then I asked, who is the husband? Jesus. Oh, okay. So I said, Jesus will go into their house. So I normally went and sat by the door, but I never saw him going in. After a uh, couple of months, I said, excuse me, teacher, that man never went into the house. How does he look like? I said, oh, no, he's a spirit man. Eh, hey, spirit? I normally thought the evil spirit was the devil. So I used to feel scared of the devil. And he said, no, he's a very good man. He loves everybody. Okay. Then one day I said, teacher, can I be one of those woman? Oh yeah, he said, you can be. You can be a nun. Do everything you can to please God. That's how he loves the nuns. So that's why these ladies are here. The sisters are here. We are here, live among the people, be with them, listen to them, help them, so that the people can live happily and peacefully. It's hard to talk about Papua as a unitary country. Traditional beliefs, the way they dress traditionally, their mentality, each group is different. We call this the one-talk system. The one-talk system comes down to people having the same culture, speaking the same language. 
There are over 700 languages here in Papua. It can be a few villages or a dozen villages. It can be a group of people, three, four thousand strong, who come from the same clan. Life is built around the community. People stick together, they are responsible for each other, but only within a particular community. If someone does something wrong, steals, rapes someone, kills someone, the community protects him. The community is willing to pay so-called compensation for what somebody did. There isn't this sense of the individual that I am responsible for my life. Within the framework of this one-talk system, you must also help others. Even if the matter does not concern you directly, you belong to a clan. And so when the time comes to pay compensation, you have to support the community. Life in the bush is very different from life in the city. We are very happy that we are where we are, because this is our home, this is our land. So house from in Osema. My house is not a typical house, built from materials bought in a store. We have to cut trees and grass and clear a space for the house in the bush. Not every man is capable of building such a house. Inside, there is a room in which the family sleep. It is a good place to live in. There is a fire in the middle of the room, on which all the meals are cooked. Men, women, children, everyone has a job to do. Daughters help in the garden, and with looking after the children, and care for the pig herd. While the sons help their fathers clear a space in the bush for the garden, they work together in the bush. We do not have money. We live from what we grow. If there is no garden, we die. I cannot steal from other people's gardens. I believe in God and in what is written in the Bible. Stealing is forbidden there. The first missionaries preached the good news, and so we decided to change some of the practices that we had adopted from our ancestors. The good news has done a lot of good. Tribal infighting has practically ceased. Tribal wars occur to this day, and everything has to tally, always. If someone dies, then someone from the other tribe has to die, before any peace talks can begin. And it doesn't matter whether you live locally, or work in a plantation, in another region, if you belong to this tribe, you have to be careful. My tribe, my life, is a life of fighting. Many lost their lives in the fighting. Many were killed. Tribal conflicts were formerly fought with bows, arrows and spears. Now, unfortunately, they are fought with guns. I have often seen people die during fights with my own eyes. We were fighting within 10 years. Uh, and uh, from my side, yeah, uh, it's about 25, 30 died. We killed um, uh, 40. Our fellow gave a cigarette to a lady. This lady died. Relative of this lady, they say that uh, you were pushing this lady. That's how we start the fight. Our sisters came to us. They said that no, no, from now on we will not fight more. So they came here to stop us 
and then from there we get fish. Now their fish, they are okay, but the ones who lost their beloved ones, like the husbands or the sons lost their fathers, or they were still filled with hatred. We call them a penance group and give them classes to accept each other and bring them back to church. The sisters come from different clans and different areas of the different cultures. And sometimes there's a clash. After all, we say, okay, let's understand each other's culture. Now, whenever we teach them, we tell them, look, we are from different places, but we accept each other and we become one body because we are the body of Christ living. And please. Yeah, they do listen to us. They are good. They can listen. And sometimes they pretend that they are listening and go back and they do the same thing again, you know. <laughs> We go to the people, we be with them. Sisters, they deliver babies and they work in the hospital where they treat the patients. We show them how to wash the babies and the children. We show them how to wash their clothes. Before, the people looked really malnourished. Now, it's a very big change. Before, they couldn't wash. You could see their deaths and you could smell it from far away. <laughs> But now they're clean, they're healthy. We have clinics, we work with people who are, have different struggles and, and problems, and you know, we do all of that. You know, it's not just a matter of preaching spirituality, which is, which is the basis, but you know, the church is there also meeting people's physical and, and, and moral and other kinds of needs as well. The area is huge because people live in small communities. You have to reach these communities. People must build a church. If they have the money, they will build a big, beautiful church. If they don't have the money, theirs will be a small kunai house similar to the other houses. We have over 300 such churches, so we need over 300 priests. We are 32. 33 together with the bishop. I'm not particularly physically fit. I was always excused from physical education, whether it was in the seminary, at secondary or primary school. And then you come here and, for example, you have to do a 15-kilometer walk. Our missionaries come with what they have experienced in their own countries. Here they have to open themselves to a completely different mentality, to a completely different way of being and way of life. You need to be prepared for misunderstandings. You also have to be prepared to face loneliness. Being alone with oneself was the most difficult to bear. When people leave the church, when they go to their homes, you are left alone. You must also be prepared for failures. There was a beautiful station in a land where wars were prevalent. The government gave the mission land and a station was built there, a very nice station. Then a conflict erupted and everything was burned. The bishop sent a priest who rebuilt everything. He did a great job. A new school, a new church, a new home for the priest, a new home for the sisters, a pastoral center. Then another war came. And once again, nothing survived. The priest could not handle it and he left. Sometimes one has days when one sits down and asks oneself, is it worth it? You, for example, hear that a village has been burned, that a house has been burned down somewhere. And fear overwhelms you. Might it not happen here? The parish priest always says, no, not in my parish. My parish is best, because my people are completely different. 
that this city is different, this country is different, but these people are the same. Each of the missionaries must overcome himself. I have never driven a motorcycle, I have never sat behind a wheel. A former missionary gave me half an hour of his time and showed me, the gears are here, the accelerator over here, you sit here and off you go. I have one such station that I really care about. There are many vocations there. It was Christmas, it began to rain during Mass. On my return journey, after five falls, I stopped counting after that, I fell again. I threw the motorcycle and said, Lord, if you want me to, I can sleep here. You know that there is one more midnight mass to be celebrated at the main station. I got up and as I picked up the motorcycle, the motor died on me. I'm not a mechanic. It turned out that the chain had fallen off. I did not have a single spanner. I said to God, okay, so I will walk. But then I told myself to try again. The chain re-engaged miraculously and I arrived on time. Same same thing Jesus is showing you me today. You got sample of Belevi looking, sample of house guy stuff, sample of problem, sample of Jesus shows us today that when dangers come, we have a safe haven. That haven is Jesus Christ. You by celebrating time below his star. Neck below me dry. Jesus tells us, no matter what your problems and concerns, with me you can win everything. I'm next to you to help you. They really need a priest, above all to have Jesus by their side, to celebrate Mass for them, to hear their confessions, but above everything else for the sacraments. They're hungry for the sacraments. Sometimes I hear people's confessions for an hour and a half, two hours. They really hear and believe that their sins are forgiven. The sacraments they receive really change them. They change their lives, but above all else, they strengthen them. They cease to only think about what was earlier, fighting their opponents and needing to find something to eat. Presently, there is something more, a search for something more. A time has come here to Papua New Guinea, a time of change. Some are ill-prepared to face that change, especially the young, especially children, who are growing up in something that their ancestors know nothing about. I guess we could call it a, really a society in rapid transition, if not upheaval. When our first missionaries came, they found people who were in the Stone Age. They were using stone instruments to, to cut wood and to chop trees and to dig the gardens and things like that. And so they were living truly in the Stone Age. And now, uh, 60 years later, the people really have been drawn, have been pulled, have been forced into 21st century. We lived reasonably comfortably in the past. Presently, life has changed. Mumu is a traditional dish which one formerly could not buy. We used to prepare it solely for the family. People presently want to profit from Mumu, and that is not good. The meal was intended for the family, not for sale. The woman who looks after the pig from the time he is a little piglet very often treats it like a member of the family. When the pig grows up and is ready for slaughter to prepare the mumu, the woman often cries. Now people raise the pigs to sell at the market. They then make the dish to maximize their profit. Goods from the garden are also treated as income at the market. 
Young people do not bring the money home, do not buy anything for their family, they do with it whatever they want. A lot of the people are caught in between. Yeah, they can't go back to the traditional times and they are not quite there with modernity. So it's a big group of people are in the middle. We skip so many steps. Civilization, uh, modernity, it's just 50 years. And all of a sudden you have, you know, laptops, you have uh, mobile phones, you have these big companies coming and you have all the technologies coming in. Now, in this country, we have, uh, and in fact, in this province, now we have this uh, big uh, LNG uh, project, and we have companies right across Papua New Guinea gold, oil, copper, nickel. It's a good thing that we have these companies uh, because we need money, we need to develop uh, the human life, and develop the society and raise the standard of uh, the people. But also at the same time, it comes with its social negative aspects. When this company began operation, a lot of the schools were closed because the teachers went looking for jobs in these uh, companies because they offered better pay. And even some of the kids, they went looking for jobs because they have so much money, they don't know what to do with it. And so they, they spend it on alcohol, homebrew, prostitution. And so we are seeing increasing number of uh, cases with venereal diseases and HIV AIDS. I'm a minister like to Masloi Goro town. I don't like going into the city. I go to the church and that's enough for me to be happy. In the city, there is a lot of talk about killings, assaults, thefts. They curse and there are a lot of drunks. It affects young people most of all, and they probably most often feel lost. Their elders sometimes talk about how they've lost touch with the young. The young are like, like the young everywhere, fascinated by all that's new, and not always able to resist. However, the city is the only place where young educated people can find work. If a young person does not find work, then he has to live from something, including theft or robbery. Ideas about city life are often mistaken. People from all over Papua New Guinea build makeshift houses and settle in the slums. It is not a safe place. Bandits often gather in groups called rascals and attack. They do not work anywhere and earn money in this way. However, villages do not have the amenities that can be found in a city such as schools, hospitals, roads, electricity. Parents worried about their children come here to better schools and teachers. That is why many people are abandoning village life. Seeing the opportunities available in the city, I decided to bring my children here so that they could study, which would assure them a better future here. Had we stayed in the village, my son would not have been educated as well. 
and would not have begun to study at one of the best universities. He finished his secondary school and now attends the UPNG. Life in the capital is not easy. It all boils down to money. Our situation is such that if times become hard, we could always go back to our family home. To where are my church, my diocese, family, relatives, friends. I can go back there and be with them. That is something that you know, people in a tribal culture, for example, in a clan-based culture, can teach us, you know, the importance of, of community, the importance of, of uh, you know, uh, working together in communion with one another, and uh, that, that um, humility that you need to be a part of a community, and the service and the, and the identity that comes from that. The church and the faith that the church comes to preach is a stabilizing factor. It's something that can bring meaning, it's something that can bring stability, something that can bring wisdom, something that can bring grace into the lives of people who have been kind of torn this way and torn that way. Our faith in Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, is something that I think can, can, can help uh, kind of the people find their identity again in the midst of all of the uh, uh, difficulties and changes and upheavals of this postmodern world. And I think that's a great gift, really, that the church can bring to people in this kind of a situation. I came to Papua New Guinea, you know, thinking I was going to be the great missionary, that I was going to be the one who was going to do all this for Jesus, and I was going to, you know, give up all of these things, my family, my culture, my food, my everything. I thought, you know, I was coming here to carry the cross, and, and uh, I was very quickly discovered that God brought me here to bless me. And all that I thought I was going to be doing for God, God has done so much more for me. In, in the simplicity of the people, sometimes I have to uh, swallow very hard I had to stop myself from choking up when I am inspired by the, uh, the faith of the people, the simplicity of the people, the, the love of the, the, the people for the church, for their priests, for the sisters. I would like to go back telling people, making people feel sorry for me that I am giving up all of these things and I've come into such hardship, but uh, it would be a lie. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else and I don't consider this a hardship. I consider this an, an incredible blessing that I could never pay God back for in a million years.